Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski. I will be your host for today. If you've been tuning in this week, the next three weeks, we are focusing on the issue of ocean plastics. So we have scientists, explorers, uh, different organizations, artists, advocates. We're all doing their part to raise the awareness about this issue and look for solutions. So it's been a great week so far. We have some more events coming up tomorrow. But today, I'm very excited to be joined by Sherry Lipiat. She served as the California Regional Coordinator for the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, Marine Debris Program since 2012. In this role, Sherry works with key stakeholders to identify regional marine debris priorities, providing expertise and oversight for their prevention, their removal, and research projects throughout the state. She also leads the Marine Debris uh, program's flagship citizen science program, the Marine Debris Monitoring and Assessment Project. Well, Sherry, it's so great to have you joining us today. We're really excited to learn a little bit more about what you do and just how uh, you're working to tackle the issue of ocean plastics. Great. Thanks, Joe. And hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for, for tuning in today. Um, I'm really excited to kind of share a little bit about uh, the work that we do um, and uh, about marine debris and, and how we can all play a part in addressing this issue. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, really quickly. All right. Uh, so I just wanted to start with a little bit of background um, about how I kind of came to, to work for NOAA. Um, my whole life, I've always been really excited about science and the environment and just loved being outside and, and especially on the water. Um, and once I took my first environmental science class in high school, I was totally hooked. Um, and in college, I studied environmental science, which included a little bit of marine science and oceanography. Um, and I just thought that was so cool because the oceans are all connected and, and part of this massive system that covers 70% of our planet and literally keeps us alive. So from there, I, I decided to go to graduate school and do a PhD in ocean science. And so that's what these photos are from um, when I was in graduate school. And I was studying uh, the chemistry of seawater and, and particularly iron in seawater. Um, so just like you and I, we all need a little bit of iron in our diets to be healthy. So do the plants and, and phytoplankton that, that live in the sea. Um, so so in, in grad school, we were going out on uh, research vessels uh, to be at sea for you know, a month at a time and collecting seawater samples from different parts of the ocean. Um, so the, the photo on the, the left is from the Gulf of Alaska. And uh, it, it seemed you know, really glamorous going out to sea all the time, but in reality, um, most of the time was spent inside the ship inside a plastic bubble or, or clean lab that we would build. And so that's the, the photo on the right. Um, and so we did this because we were measuring really, really low concentrations or amounts of iron in seawater. And we were trying to do this on a rusty ship that's really dirty and would just contaminate all of our samples. So we had to build these bubbles or clean labs that, um, that we could bring the samples into to process. Um, so that was kind of a, a really unique experiences that I that I had in grad school going out to sea. And I really, you know, had always been super curious about the way that the ocean worked and really enjoyed being contributing to the to the research and, and helping us to better understand that. Um, but really wanted to work on on something that was more related to humans and ocean conservation and how our decisions really affect the health of the ocean. So that led me to NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And I've been here for um, a little over eight years now. And in my job, I'm mostly working in an office and behind the desk, but occasionally still get to go out into the field um, to join um, partners and other organizations that were, were providing funding for their projects. Um, so this photo is from earlier this summer on the Channel Islands um, out in, in off the coast of Southern California. And this was for a project, a shoreline removal project, where you have to hike down these cliffs, collect all the debris and trash. Um, it was a lot of fishing gear that was on the beaches, pack it up and put it into these frame packs and then haul it back up the cliffs. 
Um, so it was really kind of a, a very cool adventure um, and, and a, a really great experience. So uh, marine debris um, is, is basically any solid man-made material that's in the marine environment that's not meant to be there. And it can range from teeny tiny pieces of microplastic, like you can see this person has a little micro bead on the tip of their thumb, um, to larger consumer items like uh, food packaging and other containers, lost fishing gear. So the image in the, in the bottom in the middle is of a, a, a lost crab trap that's been sitting on the bottom of the ocean for a long time. And even um, large, uh, what we call abandoned or derelict vessels that are left behind. And so this stuff gets into the environment um, from humans. So it's basically coming from either human activity on land or human activity at, at sea. And this graphic um, is kind of a, a, a schematic of how trash gets into creeks. And it really shows all of the different pathways by which trash can, can make its way into creeks and then down into to rivers, estuaries, and into the ocean. So it can include things like um, litter blowing off of trash trucks or, or being thrown out of cars and trucks, spills on collection day. So if you have garbage, um, garbage cans on the sidewalk and you know there's wind or um, you know critters or something that are that are coming by and spilling it. Um, uncovered or, or overflowing bins. Um, and then illegal dumping, you know, direct kind of littering and dumping. And just basically there are all these different pathways by which trash can get into our storm drains and eventually um, make its way into the environment. And so you can end up with situations like this. This is a kind of an iconic image from um, the mouth of the LA, the Los Angeles River in California. And here you can see this kind of floating, um, what we call a trash boom, that's collecting all of this trash that's washed down the water, the, the, the river. And you can see a lot of it, it looks like styrofoam kind of food packaging. Um, and there's this construction equipment that that's trying to, to remove it. And this marine debris is basically, we've found it everywhere on the earth that we've looked. Um, so the image on the left is from far out in the Pacific Ocean in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands where no humans live within thousands of miles of here. And you can see that it's just this beach has accumulated a lot of, of debris, including um, what looks like a lot of um, fishing buoys. And the image on the right is, is a, an ice core from the Arctic. Um, so basically they drilled down into the Arctic sea ice and looked inside and they found little tiny pieces of plastic inside of the sea ice. And we care about this because it has impacts on sea life. Um, so critters can be impacted through um, entanglement. So basically they can become trapped in fishing gear or other types of debris. Um, and they can also ingest debris, which can um, cause them to starve and have, um, have, have uh, potential chemical impacts. So if there's if there's nasty chemicals associated with the plastic that they're ingesting, there could be problems there as well. And it can also impact habitats. So this is um, an image from uh, the Florida Keys and you can see this, it used to be a, a lobster trap and it was left there on the seafloor for a while and it's totally kind of scoured or like um, damaged a, a big area of what used to be a nice, nice coral reef. And there are also impacts on humans. Um, so it can be a, a problem for safety and navigation of ships at sea if they become um, entangled in, in, in any debris that's out there. Um, so this is an image of a, a big fishing rope wrapped around a propeller of a ship. And so the good news is that there are a number of solutions to this issue. And there are ways that every one of us um, can get involved in addressing it. And so that's part of why I'm so, so passionate about the issue is that compared to some other you know, massive environmental challenges, it, it seems very solvable. Um, and prevention starts with every, every one of us that create waste. And uh, the NOAA Marine Debris Program works with partners um, and provides funding to organizations uh, that are, are trying to prevent debris at the source. So uh, this image is from a project in California um, called One Cool Earth. And they, uh, they go to different schools and do trash audits with the students. 
Um, and so this is something that any classroom can do. Um, if you wanna reduce the amount of waste that your class produces, a great way to start is to, to understand what you're already um, what you're already creating and what you're already throwing away and, re and recycling. So basically these students are kind of classifying all the trash that's created. You can see that they're wearing gloves, so it's not too, too ooey gooey. Um, and basically they just write down everything that they threw away for, for a week and, and look at what the most common items are. And a lot of um, the waste, if you remember from the, the photo I showed from the LA River, a lot of that was food packaging. And that's a lot of what, what the trash that ends up as litter and marine debris. So if you think about a meal that you recently had, it might've been served in mostly disposable single-use containers. Like you can see here on the left where there's kind of the disposable clamshell container, a plastic utensil and a little plastic container for the salad dressing. And so in some cases, it's really easy for restaurants and, and customers to switch to using reusable plates and utensils that can be washed and used again. So we also work with a number of different um, organizations like the Clean Water Fund that are, are helping restaurants and, and customers um, make these, these changes and reduce the amount of waste that's created. And any time that we reduce the amount of waste that's created, there's less that has a, the potential to end up um, in our environment. And I talked a little bit about fishing gear. Um, and so a lot of fishermen are getting involved in cleaning up debris that's left in the environment. So here, this is um, from a, a project on the East Coast where fishermen, at the end of the crab season, they, they go out on their boats and look for any crab traps that were left behind and then remove those. And in some cases, if they're tagged with, uh, and they can, they can tell who the original owner of those crab traps were, they can actually go back and um, sell them back to the original owner at a reduced price, a little bit lower than what a, a new crab trap would cost. And then the, that, the money that they make from selling them back can go back into financing the program. So it's sort of self-sustaining and, and a great way for these fishermen to keep the, the environment clean. And engineers are also uh, developing some creative solutions for how to, to capture debris that's already entered the, the environment. Um, so these are kind of two of my, my favorite, uh, uh, Mr. Trash Wheel and Professor Trash Wheel. And these are um, in Baltimore, Maryland. And basically you can see kind of the orange um, plastic floating parts are booms and they're um, catching any, any floating debris that comes down the river and then it's put onto this conveyor belt and, and dumped into a, a dumpster um, in the back. And so, so like I said, this is a great way that once debris is already in the environment to, to, to catch it where it's really concentrated um, and, and remove it. And, and another uh, thing that we can all do is participate in, in beach cleanups or even river cleanups, um, basically any, any kind of trash cleanups. Um, so Saturday, this Saturday, September 15th, is actually the International Coastal Cleanup Day. And it's a really great opportunity to, to get involved. And there's going to be cleanups all over the world on Saturday. Um, so if you're interested, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to talk to your, your parents. And, and no matter how far you live from the coast, there's probably a, a cleanup happening nearby. Another... Uh, great way to get involved is to help us collect data. So once we, when we have more data on the types and abundances of trash in the environment, it helps us to better um, address the issue and, and develop uh, more effective solutions. And so an easy way to do this is through the Marine Debris Tracker app, um, which is just a smartphone app where you basically log any litter or debris that you see. Um, that, and it can be, you know, like I said, far inland or at the coast. And so that data comes to NOAA and is available for other scientists to, to analyze. And if you're really into data collection, um, you can check out the NOAA has a marine debris monitoring and assessment project, which is kind of more, um, more structured surveys that happen on, on shorelines um, with you know, specific protocols and, and data sheets and that kind of thing. Um, and we have, a, a, for teachers, we have a, a toolkit for educators online that kind of um, combines this with some, some, uh, some good curriculum and other activities for students. And then the last thing I wanna share um, 
is that we can all make a, a big contribution to this issue through following the four R's. So they're reduce, reuse, recycle, and refuse. So refusing unnecessary packaging or, or other wasteful products. Um, and, you know, often I think people feel like, well, you know, I'm only one person, what kind of difference can I make? Um, and, you know, I think that that's just really not true. And if every one of us who creates trash took action, it would add up to a whole lot of change. Um, so thank you guys for listening. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to, to, to chat a little bit and, and take your questions. All right, excellent. Well, Sherry, thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us. I, um, you know, some of those images you shared are really powerful. I, it always amazes me to see the pictures of those beaches so far away from human mm -hmm. uh, habitation and they're covered with plastics from all over the world. So it really is a global problem and there's just nowhere that's unaffected. So it really is a, a serious issue right now. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And obviously thank you for the work you're doing to, to monitor, to remove, and just to look for those kind of real solutions that are gonna make a difference. Yeah, it's my pleasure. All right, well, let's meet some of our classrooms. I'm sure they have some questions. If we have classrooms joining online, um, there is a YouTube chat sidebar. Feel free to send us in a question and let us know uh, where you're watching from and we'll make sure that the question gets to Sherry. But for now, let's meet one of our on-camera classrooms. So let's start off, let's go to Woodbridge, Connecticut. We have some sixth grade students with Mrs. Tishkoff. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, great students? You can wait and say hi. Hi. All right. Who's All right. Who's right. Who's Loud and clear. <laughs> Shh. Do you think that at some point people would consider what waste life in their everyday life and avoid using plastic? Did you catch I, it? Was, yeah. yeah. Or do you need a little? Speak loud. Yeah, try to get out of the Do you think that at some point people uh, would consider good life in their everyday life and every using plastic? Is the question, the question if I think that one thing is not using plastic? Um, I think plastic is really important for a lot of um, essential things um, from, you know, cars we drive to the desks that we use, computers, a lot of, um, it has a lot of uses in, in the medical world. So, you know, keeping us healthy. Um, so I think that, you know, plastic is most of the, the debris that we see in the environment, but also most of that plastic is single use disposable plastic. So I think that we just need to be smarter about the the amount of um, of this, you know, single use kind of throwaway stuff that we're using. Um, so, you know, I don't think that it's it's kind of a, a war on on all plastic, but but mostly kind of targeting um, the, the wasteful plastic that we're using. So really good question. All right. A really great question. That's such a good point is that plastic really does serve some really important purposes and can last for years and years and years, but it's the ones that we use once and just, and throw away. So one other really solution I have right here with me that people are starting to carry around more is their own utensils. So if you yeah. have your little utensil pack with you, you can use them instead of the plastic ones and uh, then you're not throwing those single use things away. So that's a, a really easy solution. Let's see, let's, go to Austin, Texas this time. We have some students in the library joining us on their lunch hour with Mrs. Hance. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, Austin? Hi. Hi. Nice and loud. Um, so how many pounds of plastic go into the ocean every year? Um, so I can't do the math really quickly in my head, but 8 million tons of plastic enter, are, are estimated to enter the ocean every year um, from, from coastal nations. 
And so that's the equivalent of a dump truck of plastic entering the ocean every minute, which is just kind of staggering if, if you think about it. Um, and there's there are some maps online of where they where the scientists think that most of the plastic is coming from, like which countries. And a lot of them are the highest contributors are in Southeast Asia, where there's kind of really rapid um, population growth and economic development, but the waste management infrastructure just isn't quite keeping up. Um, but if you look at at the the list of kind of the top twenty. Um, countries that are contributing to, to plastic entering the ocean, the U.S. is is at number twenty, um, and so we're we're definitely not off the hook because we are we are responsible for a lot of a lot of this waste entering the ocean, and we actually have the highest rates of of basically waste generation per person. Um, so we're we're consuming and using more trash than than any other country in the world. Um, it just so happens that, you know, we have pretty good waste management infrastructure that that's able to, you know, like you have your trash pickup and recycling pickup, and it's it 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 prevents a lot of waste from from leaking into the environment. So yeah, there's a staggering amount of plastic entering the ocean. A lot of it's coming from Southeast Asia, but a lot of it's also coming from from North America. Good question. All right, a great question. And yeah, that that dump truck uh, statistic—that's a scary one. That uh, every minute, and I think that really highlights the issue. Is a lot of people are looking at how can we take the plastic out of the ocean. But step one, we got to turn that tap off first. We got to stop the plastic from getting there in the first place. Then we can tackle the the other issues. So it's exactly. a, challenging, a challenging issue. All right, so we're gonna jump to Canada now. Mrs. Douglas' class is in Brampton, Ontario. We've got some grade six, seven, and eight students. And I know your microphone's not working today, so if you wanna type in uh, some questions into the chat sidebar, I'll keep my eye out for those, and I will make sure that they get to Sherry. Um, let's jump now to our classroom, joining us uh, in Mount Airy, North Carolina, grade five students at Franklin Elementary. Let me turn their mic on. How are we doing, grade fives? Good. <laughs> How did you earn your job? Oh, <laughs> good question. Um, I think everyone everyone's path is different. Um, I came to NOAA through uh, what's called a fellowship program for um, current um, graduate students. And so, so NOAA is always looking for um, kind of scientists to bring to bring into more of the, the policy and, and management, um, kind of like the government world. So um, yeah, I, I just found an opportunity and and applied for the fellowship, and that kind of um, got it was a temporary one year thing at first, and then it, it got my foot in the door. Um, but yeah, I would I would encourage students that are are interested in in kind of getting into marine science or marine policy to just start um, you know always be really curious and 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 talk to organizations that are doing the kind of um, work that you're interested in and you know you can start volunteering at a, at a really young age and and get to know the issue um, and and kind of have a, a good idea of, of what you want to do when when you're you're looking for a job someday yeah. yeah that's a great point sherry there's um you know i think a lot of students sometimes think because you're younger your voice doesn't have as big of an impact or you can't start doing things early but uh that couldn't be further from the truth i know of lots of students who have started their own organizations who have written letters and gone and spoken at their city councils. Uh, lots of students who are able to make a difference at a young age, and then that also helps uh, going forward in the future. And of course, science courses, lots and lots of science courses. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, we do have... Joe, I think you're, you are mu muted yourself. Whoops, I hit the wrong button. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So uh, our class in um, Brampton, they have a question about a device being used in the Pacific Ocean. So I think they're talking about the Ocean Cleanup Project. Mm -hmm. And I believe they're even piloting it uh, near you in, in uh, California. And so they're wondering if you know anything about how that works. 
Um, yeah, so they actually, they, they towed out kind of their test system through the San Francisco Bay just this past weekend, and now it's, it's on the way out to the middle of the Pacific. Um, and so their, their um, strategy is to use this um, big kind of like I showed the image of the boom at a river mouth. They have a similar thing that's bigger and, and, and thicker and um, is designed to kind of accumulate um, trash that's already floating out in the middle of the, the open ocean. Um, it's really kind of, there's, there's a lot of controversy and, and people have different opinions on whether it's going to work. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think it's, I'm definitely following it very closely and, and I'm really curious to kind of see and, and hope that they have some success. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of kind of innovative ideas out there and, and that's, we need all of those at the table to, to address this issue. Um, I think, a, a, a like Joe was saying earlier, the, the most effective way to, to stop this problem is preventing it at the source. Um, so, you know, at, at NOAA, we kind of focus more on prevention. And when we do removal, it's more in the coastal areas where, where debris is kind of in, in higher, um, accumulated in, in kind of more dense, or there's more, more there to, to kind of get more bang for your buck on the, the removal. Um, and we also use the, the example of if your bathtub was overflowing and you needed to do something, would you grab a mop and try to start cleaning it up or turn off the tap and, and stop the stop it at the source? Um, so, you know, I think long term, we're going to need to to look at all of these different solutions to the issue and cleaning up debris that's already in the environment is certainly important. But the most effective way to address it is, is through prevention. Absolutely. I love that analogy. That's a great analogy. And yeah, I mean, obviously this project, they've managed to raise a lot of money and we'll see what happens, but at the very least it's raising awareness. So exactly. Yeah. Definitely worth something. Yep. People are definitely talking about it. <laughs> All right. Let's jump back to Connecticut and visit Mrs. Tishkoff's class again. Uh, go uh, ahead. Go ahead. Make class. sure they. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, how many animals die a year a year of this? And have any species gone extinct? If so, how many? Great, Great question. question. Um, that are they're really hard questions to answer. Um, the problem with kind of counting the number of animals that that are killed from um, entanglement or ingesting plastic or other types of debris is that oftentimes we probably don't even see it. Um, so it's really hard to, to estimate the, the number, the actual number of animals that are killed. We do know, looking across all of the, the animals that have been found, that there's more than 800 different species that have been impacted by debris. So that's either through entanglement, so, you know, like a sea turtle or a fish or a whale being entangled in a fishing line that's left out there. Um, ingestion, where seabirds and, and other, other critters can... Um, swallow debris and it, it like fills up their guts and makes them either have this like false feeling feeling of fullness where where they're not actually eating anything that um, that's providing nutrients but they're just kind of eating this plastic that that's not healthy for them um, and it can also kind of you know uh, cut cut up some of their organs and, and have problems I mean you can imagine eating plastic is not not a good thing um, so yeah, so it's really hard to estimate the total number of animals that have been killed, um, but a lot are a lot are being affected. And in terms of um, animals going extinct, there aren't any any instances where we've been able to to directly correlate extinctions to marine debris. But there are certain species like the Hawaiian monk seal in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands that are critically endangered and live in these environments where. There's a lot of, of, of debris, and we know that the debris is impacting them. Um, so certainly, you know, I think it, it's contributing to um, to impacts on on endangered species. Absolutely, no question about that. And it's scary too because there's species like the sea turtles, uh, which many, if not all, the seven species are threatened right now. Many albatross species are threatened and endangered. So. These are animals that are going to come into contact with those plastics and it's not helping, not helping the cause at all. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't before, uh, take a look online and you can see some pretty startling pictures of seabirds 
who have died on these remote beaches. And when they look inside their stomachs, there's everything from uh, lighters to toy soldiers and toothbrushes filling their stomachs. It's it's a quite a scary issue. Yeah. All right, let's jump to Austin, Texas, and talk to the Pants group again. Is it true that there are like plastic islands in the oceans? Oh, good question. I'm glad that you asked that. Um, it is not true. <laughs> um, I think that there are kind of these misconceptions that um, that there are these, you know, massive accumulations of plastic in the in the middle of the the gyres that you can actually walk on or see from space. Where in reality, there are these accumulations. We call them garbage patches. And it's more like a peppery soup of plastic debris. So there's, you know, you can actually sail through parts of them and not know that you're in the, the middle of the, the garbage patch unless you're you're collecting a sample or towing a net and kind of looking at what's coming up because the, the plastics are, are in many cases very small. Um, you can also find larger, larger items there like big uh, bundles and accumulations of fishing net. Um, but these areas form just because of the way that the, the currents are, are turning and the way that the, the earth is spinning, it kind of forces the anything that's floating at the surface of the ocean into these, these accumulation zones. Um, so it pushes, you know, any, any plastic that's floating, even any natural debris that's floating um, into areas where it's just more, more concentrated than it is in other parts of the ocean. So we call these the garbage patches. Um, and um, yeah, they aren't they aren't so dense that you can you can walk on them or scoop them up or or see them from space. All right, I think that's a really good point because uh, it does deceive a lot of people, especially because the pieces do get so small. So the sun breaks down the plastic into small pieces, but then there's the pro another problem created. There is now those smaller pieces can get into the the ecosystem again to the food chain a lot easier and be mistaken for food items. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's go back to our classroom in North Carolina and see if they have another question for us. Oops, I turned their microphone off. There we go. How much trash? How much trash do you think Hurricane Florence will make on the beach? Wow, good question and very relevant. Um, I think you know hurricanes, especially over the past few years, when we've been seeing more, they have pulled a lot of a lot of debris into the water. Um, both kind of trash and small, you know, if there's like a trash can that's not secured, um, it can be a lot of smaller debris, but also big items like boats and fishing gear that's left out can become dislodged and move around. Um, coastal, you know, like parts of docks and even after Hurricane Sandy, we saw, you know, entire homes that were, were pushed into the water. Um, so these massive, you know, the big natural disasters are a big source of, of debris. Um, and, you know, really all we can do is kind of make sure that that anything kind of loose um, that we have out out in our yards or, or outside the school or anywhere um, that we can secure is is secured ahead of time. Um, but it really is kind of a, a scary thing and um, can can put a lot of a lot of debris into the water. Um, and so after after some of these big hurricanes, NOAA gets involved by doing um, we do overflight. Um, overflight surveys to kind of look at where these big items are. And then we work with partners at the state government and, and other, um, other organizations to kind of identify the targets and, and try to remove them after the storm. Um, but that's kind of a longer process, you know, that comes after making sure that people are safe and, and have water and electricity and all of that kind of stuff. So it, it um, even today, we're still working on cleaning up um, debris from, from hurricanes last year. All right, that's a great question. And we're definitely glad that your class is a little further inland. So you yeah. won't feel as much of an impact, but I'm sure you're gonna get some heavy rain, so. All right, well, we still have some time. So what I'm gonna do is open it up to classrooms uh, for questions. So if you just wave at the camera, that'll be my signal. We need to check your classroom again and uh, we'll get you up for another question. And I already see waving back in North Carolina. So we'll start right there and then we'll see who else has a question? So go ahead, grade fives. Go ahead, Gracie. How long have you been doing this? Oh, um, 
Uh, so I've been working for NOAA since 2010. Um, so it's been a, a little bit over over eight years, but I like to think that I've been, um, you know, working on on protecting the ocean and our environment since I was since I was a young kid in, in grade school, um, and and did you know different kind of cleanup activities and and started learning about it. So. Yeah. Awesome. And let's go back to Connecticut. I see lots of waving in Woodbridge. Oh, hey, Todd. Nice and loud. How does the debris affect creatures that live near the bottom of the ocean? Good question. Um, so it, it a lot of the same impacts that occur um, at the surface of the ocean also occur on the seafloor. So um, if there's trash or uh, plastic or other debris that's more dense than seawater, it'll sink through, you know, from the surface down to the seafloor and kind of just accumulate there in the sediments. Um, so it can impact habitats by kind of just being this, you know, having this physical presence that the waves move it around and it can scour or smother habitats that need, you know, sunlight or other nutrients and, and just kind of need like a, a, a really stable substrate. And so the, the debris can have those like physical impacts on, on the habitats and also um, could, um, if it's small enough, different fish and other animals that live on the seafloor can ingest it um, or, or become entangled in it. If there are things like fishing gear that has kind of um, loose lines and, and other things that, that can, can trap the animals. All right. And Sherry, what about um, the chemicals in the plastic? Do those leach out into the water? Yeah. So there's um, concerns about plastic, um, the, the different additives that go into making, making a piece of plastic. Um, so there's um, organic chemicals that, that can leach from inside the plastic out into the environment or into um, the organs of, of critters that ingest it. But there's also chemicals that are already present in seawater, um, big organic contaminants that that actually um, will attach onto the surface of the plastic um, because of the, the way the chemistry works. The chemicals would be much happier attached to the plastic than just kind of free floating in, in seawater. Um, so this this creates concerns that these contaminants are are concentrated on the surface of the plastic that then when species ingest them, they're exposed to higher concentrations. Um, so it's kind of a twofold thing where there's, pla there's chemicals that are attracted to the plastic and chemicals that are inside the plastic that can, can transfer out of the plastic into different uh, species. All right, and I think something that we don't think about a lot is um, how we're at the top of the food chain. So if things below us are eating plastics, it just magnifies all the way up. And then we eat a lot of fish around the world. So now we're getting those contaminants right into our bodies. And I don't even think we've done all the studies yet to know exactly what's happening. Yeah, there's a lot of research that that's still going into that. And recently we've found um, fibers from like clothing and, and other upholstery um, are actually kind of floating through the air as well. And so, you know, if you have if you sit by a sunny window and, and you kind of see dust floating through the air, some of that might actually be plastic. So scientists are trying to figure out how much of an, an issue that is and, and what we can do about it. All right, and let's take one more visit into our class in Austin, Texas. Your microphone is on. All right, I'm asking on behalf of a nervous student, but so you guys talked a little bit about how the US is number 20 in terms of this plastic in the ocean, how are you guys working with other countries or how are we connecting with other countries around the world to perhaps help them also reduce the amount of plastic that they're adding to the, the oceans? Yeah, really great question. Um, so the US is, is an organizations outside of the government and inside the government are working really closely to kind of share um, share information and share research findings, share you know different protocols and resources we have available for monitoring and better understanding the issue. So we're doing a lot of work in Indonesia and in China and other parts of Southeast Asia um, to to kind of share these resources and lessons that we've learned um, from you know setting up up um, different waste management. Um, 
policies and, and improving infrastructure. Um, and uh, there are a lot of really smart people in these nations that are, are developing um, uh, really kind of innovative solutions. Um, one recently that I heard about is a, a system in Indonesia to connect um, uh, waste pickers. So there are people that, that go and, and actually kind of can make money off of waste that's collected. And so kind of trying to connect them to more resources to make that a more, um, a more sustainable uh, uh, career and, and help them make more money basically off of the waste that they're collecting so that more of this, of this trash is collected and recycled and reused rather than getting in, into the environment. So we are doing a lot of, a lot of work with, with other countries kind of trying to, to, um, to reduce the amount of, of plastic that's going in and, and share things that we've learned along the way so that maybe it can be more effectively implemented in, in those other countries. All right, and that's a really good question and a really good point about different organizations helping out. And I always like to share this. So uh, there's a company in South America, in, our, in Chile named Boreo, and they take fish nets out of the ocean. They pay fishermen as well to take their old fish nets and then they turn them into really cool things like sunglasses, uh, office chairs, Jenga sets, and skateboards. So this is really cool. This is the first skateboard where the deck is made entirely of recycled fishnets. So that's really neat. So lots of people are looking for really neat ways to kind of tackle um, these ocean issues. All right. Well, first of all, classrooms, thank you so much. Your questions today have been awesome as always. Thank you so much for hanging out with us and showing interest in this really important issue. And then I also want to thank you, Sherry. Thank you so much for the work you do and for taking time from your day to hang out with us and share your story and the story of Noah and the Marine Debris team and what you guys are doing. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks and, and thank, and thank all, all of you guys, guys for taking the time, time to tune in. It's been really great chatting with you guys. All right, so let me turn on the microphone. Say goodbye and thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. 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 Okay. Thanks, Thanks so much for hanging out. We'll see you tomorrow when we're hanging out with a scientist from Tasmania who will talk about seabirds and plastic. And we still have two more weeks of events. So we look forward to seeing everybody joining in some more Ocean Plastics events. Thank you, classrooms. And thank you, Sherry. Right. Thank you, guys. Bye.